Neil Bailey Rides, episode 13, take 17. Hello and welcome to the Neil Bailey Rides YouTube channel. Episode 13. I'm Neil Bailey. I'm Basil Collier. And you're looking for the shiny Baz. You're not back on the Danish detox, are you? I am not on the Danish detox. Lesson learned. No, I'm probably shiny because I skipped hair and makeup. Why? Oh man, I just feel like that last girl had some kind of like clockwork orange fetish. Come and have one in the yarbles! If you have any yarbles, you eunuch jelly thou! I mean, do you not think you're supposed to do this before we start filming, Basil? No, man, it's cool. I'll do it. I'm a pro, all right? I'll take one for the team. But can we have a conversation about your eyebrows? Sorry. Eyebrow trimmer! I got you. Well, enough with the manscaping, Neil. Let's get right to the content. To the show. Great show today, Baz. Yeah. I have an excellent interview with Florian Neuhauser, who's awesome. the owner and publisher of Roadrunner Magazine, who's going to talk a little bit about his personal life with motorcycling. Um, Basil, of course, will have some news. Who knows what that's going to be. And um, Nate is, uh, I think he's out of his anger management class, Baz. Awesome. Awesome. He always brings it. And are we allowed to talk about the awesome 2020 Triumph Scrambler? I think we might be able to talk a little bit about it. So we have a 2020 Triumph Scrambler. It's going to be our shameless plug. So you kind of spoiled it, but we can, we can tease it off. So to the show. To the show. You have no idea getting rid of Basil, man. Sorry, I took a long time. It's about nine o'clock. You got a long way to go. So, anyway, here we are with our guest interview this evening, Florian Newhouse. He's here from. Uh, he represents Roadrunner Magazine. Um, we're not actually really here to talk about your um, business tonight. We're actually here to talk about you. Finally, finally, I'm so, a real person. You're a real person, right? So, Florian and I have been friends for probably about what 15 years. Yeah, 15 years. Uh, probably right from the beginning. Right. So, born in Austria. Born in Austria, raised in Austria, and moved to America when I was 13 years old in 1999. And shortly after, my parents started the magazine, and of course, always had to help along with it. See, this is so you know digging into people's lives now. So, Florian's born, as you say, born in Austria. His mom and dad, Krista and Krista, Krista and Christian Neuhauser, came to America. Never had a motorcycle publication. Dad was a photographer. They obviously were entrepreneurial and they decided they were going to start a motorcycle magazine. Yeah, it was a crazy idea. I mean, uh, both very entrepreneurial. My dad was a master photographer mm. and in Austria it was always, um, I mean, now everything is called the side hustle, but my parents always had a million side hustles and we were always involved in it, my brother and I, uh, whether it be sorting through photos in the evening or going on errands, going to the, the, the dark room. It was always something. So when we moved to America, the plan was for my parents to have a quieter life, mm. but that didn't really materialize because they got restless leg syndrome real quick. And my dad realized there's a gap in um, the motorcycle magazines about a travel magazine. And that's when he decided and had this crazy idea that we should do one, even though didn't know the language, don't know anything about the motorcycle industry, and of course, no money. But somehow got it off the ground and yeah, rest is history. So you guys arrived in 99, by 01, your mom and dad had start the magazine, wrote her in a magazine. And uh, back in those days, of course, we were using slide films. So when Florian was talking about being in the dark room, I mean, we're all in this digital age now, but I mean, I met your dad and your mum fairly at about that time and started actually working for the magazine. So I was on tour quite often with your dad and sometimes with your mum. And I remember we shot everything in those days on slide. And of course, you're back in the dark room processing this. Stuff, yeah, right? processing and it's a whole different dynamic if you uh, shoot a motorcycle tour and motorcycle tests on film. You really have to know what you're doing and there is very little room for error. Yeah, a lot of times I would go out with your dad, I would do the words and he'd do the pictures. So I had a lot of wild and crazy adventures with your dad to his stories. So you're a teenager, he sticks you on a motor to Goodsy, California for your first bike and you sort of wobble off down the road and live to tell the tale, right? Yeah, of course. Um, my parents, uh, all of a sudden I have a motorcycle magazine. I mean, that's the coolest thing ever for a young kid. 
and we always wanted to ride motorcycles too and finally we talked him into uh, us uh, letting ride one of the biggest cruisers we've ever had in the garage probably not the best idea for the first motorcycle and he held the the handlebar as uh, we were letting out the clutch and he was almost pushing us off the road and when we got to the next mailbox he almost pushed me into the mailbox which that's when i had to yell and say let go and crack the throttle a little bit so he couldn't run after and that's went up and down the road and after that incident, we realized it's probably best if we get some professional instruction on how to ride a motorcycle. And this is you and your brother? Yeah. Because he's right. two years older. Yeah, correct? he's two yeah. years older. And he was, of course, part of the tech crew of the magazine as well? Always, yeah. It's uh, From the very beginning, he helped out with the website and all of our uh, back office systems, a lot of uh, custom coded solutions. Mm. And in the very beginning, I handled all of our subscription fulfillment, all the data entry, payment processing, um, yeah, just like the the early days in Austria with the photography business, so any, always any, helping. Any child labor laws at stake here? I mean, like well, we weren't getting paid, so <laughs> <laughs> probably not. But you went to Austria and you did your motorcycle course. So obviously, then you come back and you start riding, and uh, you're not, but you weren't riding for the magazine at that time because I remember you were quite young. Because obviously, I'm old, not that old yet. But uh, yeah, at the time we were um, had all these motorcycles in the garage, and we officially learned how to ride it in Austria, even though we weren't legally allowed to have a license yet. But we had all these motorcycles in the garage and we would go on all of our uh, little weekend adventures as a family, four of us, my dad in the front and then me and then my brother and then my mom at the end. And pretty much every weekend we would ride somewhere and my dad was in the front in the mountains. He would hold up his fingers and tell us which gear we should be in or shouldn't be in. and all very nerve-wracking because I still see him in front of me riding because he was always in his rearview mirrors. I don't think he ever looked forward. <laughs> He's so worried about you. And always, brother. always. And but those were really fun times riding together mm. as a family. And then of course every once in a while they would leave on a, a travel assignment, and all the bikes were still in the garage. So, so you and your brother were left. Yes, unattended with a lot of uh, fancy <laughs> toys. So th those were uh, the good ones. The the best memory I have was when we had the the big Goldwing there, six disc CD changer in the back trunk lit there. Uh, I've never ridden a Goldwing before, so I figured, why not now? So I took it and picked up uh, picked up a girl I knew back then, and we rode around town and music cranking, and it was good times. So you guys, this is some really pretty awesome memories, right? Yes, definitely. And this is just such a bold step, you know, a family moving here from Austria, don't speak the language, you start an English speaking publication. And so this was a great time, but then, you know, an amazing tragedy happened in your life. And in 05, you, your mom and your brother are in Austria. And then pick up the story for us, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, my dad passed away in 2005 um, in a motorcycle accident. Um, mm. We were all in Austria, my mom, my brother and I, we were in Austria in the summer and my dad decided not to come that year for work reasons. And we were in Austria and we we got the call, we found out that, that my dad passed away. And that was, uh, yeah, the, the shittiest time of our lives and the mm. worst flight home that anybody could have imagined. Mm. And then picking up the pieces, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's still all very surreal. You just you think it'll never happen to you, or nothing can ever happen like this to you, mm -hmm. and then it happens, and it's um, yeah. Then I think the body just takes over and goes into autopilot, and for for a long time actually, mm -hmm. and then you just keep going, and yeah. I mean, we didn't quite know how to move on from that, but well, I think what's you know it's. Very impressive that as a family you made a decision to stay in the motorcycle industry. You didn't let what happened to your father put you guys off. And I mean, you've gone on strength to strength. And no, it, it was a freak accident. Mm. And you know, af all the people that that contacted us, there wasn't one person there that said you should stop riding motorcycles. Mm. It was all words of encouragement, and you can do this, and you should carry on, mm. and. I mean, at that time, Roadrunner was our livelihood, and mm. it was our passion, and then your that mother, was my uh, my dad's baby. I mean, mm. he, he thought this crazy idea up, and then my parents made it into a reality, 
and then can't let that let that go away mm. and yeah and my mom was really the the focus on this she was mm. the the driving force behind it and said no we're, we're going to continue doing this and we were just there to, to help and support her mm. and i mean i just remember those years i mean florian's mother krista is just an amazing lady i mean she's an incredible writer writer traveler businesswoman employer i mean you know she just held that whole thing together and i mean it was probably less than a year after um christian had passed away that uh, we were all on tour together making that dvd up in the mountains and she had employed new editors you guys were writing i was working with you and you know to move on as a family i mean i always think that's incredible and to I don't know, how do you get over that? I mean, it's a, it's a tough one to do, right? Yeah, and it really, it, it took a long, long time. I mean, it was just many years of just putting our heads down and working through everything. And mm -hmm. it's always, um, I like saying this because it's so true. Um, Self-employed in German means selbstständig. Mm -hmm. And if you translate it word for word, it means self and always. <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, really, for years, all we did was work. Mm -hmm. And the the dvd and the helen georgia dvd mm -hmm. was one of those uh, ideas we've always had and well my dad always had to and that, it was like now or never let's mm -hmm. do this it's a good way to get out change a few things mm -hmm. up and yeah it was now it lives on our youtube channel and gets a ton mm -hmm. of views still oh, that's and great i need to go back and look at that but you know there's always a silver lining i guess for us in life and so after your dad passed away, you created a memorial ride and you pick up the story because some, this is the best thing that happened in your life happened at the, your dad's memorial ride. And, and it's one of those things that I think about that so often. It's my dad passed away in 2005 mm. and then we had a memorial ride in 2006 already. But at the 2007 memorial ride, my future father-in-law, Steve, was there. And even though it was a small event, about 30, 35 people, I don't remember specifically talking to him and meeting him, but one of our journalists, Jim Parks, he talked with him and they started getting together on, uh, on dual sport riding and off-road riding. And a year later, um, Jim, my mom, my brother and I found ourselves in uh, Steve's backyard in Coshocton, Ohio for our first Shamrock tour on dual sport bikes. And at the end of this tour is when I met my, uh, my wife, Sarah. And it's, it's really, it's a thing about this so many times. It, did my dad have to die for me to meet my wife? It's it's mm. so weird. It's uh, I can't explain it. I think yeah. about Ooh. it all the time. That's kind of a goosebump moment, right? So you've met Sarah. Kind of talk us through the last ten years because now you're sort of you're working in the touring press intro. And I mean, a lot of people don't know what does it involve to go on a press intro. What does it involve leading tours? And if you'd like to just give us a quick kind of insight into your life as a road tester and a tour leader for sure after uh after finished college after many tries and many years um met sarah and then we started dating and that's also the the time that i started being more active in the magazine on going on press intros and doing travel stories and those last uh 10 12 years they have flown by so quickly mm -hmm. um, going on on press launches is a whole lot of fun it's very stressful but a lot of fun the very first one I did was in uh, 2010. I remember it uh, very well. It was the Honda VFR 1200, um, the first bike they uh, they put the DCT on it, and it was out in California. And didn't know what to expect, but couldn't have been more professional. You have uh, all of the journalists there that, I mean, even I, I mean, growing up, I read all the other motorcycle magazines too. So all the journalists are there and you start talking to them. It's uh, it's one thing to read a review, but it's another when you meet such knowledgeable people in person. And there's only so many words you can put in a test, but when they talk about the motorcycle and why it behaves this way and why it doesn't behave this way and all of the components and how it all goes together it was just fascinating. And yeah, it's a steep learning curve. It's uh, it's not for the faint of heart because most um, press rides are um, very spirited rides, which um, thankfully I wasn't uh, I wasn't not accustomed to at the time, but it still takes us up to uh, to another level, and that's why it's always the the most fun going on the press launches. I mean, yes, the the locations are fun and the new bikes are wonderful, but it's always the people that make it special for me mm. and the riding. Um, 
Uh, so far, I think I've been to 33 countries in the world and the testing, most of my tests have been in, uh, in America. There were a few in Canada and Europe and the most memorable recent one was in Morocco for the KTM 790 adventure. Yeah, the, the press intros, um, they were always uh, a lot of fun. It's, it's really the being together with like-minded people, right? right. That's the, the thing I always enjoy the most. So that's been a pretty wild 10 years. Well, guys, we could probably go on about press intros for about the next couple of weeks here, I would imagine, but we do need to wrap this up. Um, obviously, you do the tours, do the travels, and the big news tonight is Florian has dropped us off a Triumph Scrambler 1200, and we're gonna get into some adventures. So we won't talk too much about that, but um, it'll give you a good excuse to come back. So, ladies and gentlemen, Florian Newhazer from Roadrunner Magazine, thanks for giving us a bit of an insight into a, uh, I think, a very interesting motorcycle life. All right, thanks, Neil. Shameless plug, here we go. So um, we have a very direct shameless plug. We are now offering Neil Bailey Rides t-shirts. So um, if you would like this new style, uh, just DM me through one of my social media things, 20 bucks, shipping and handling. Basil will put it in a bag and pop it out to you and you can uh, you can be repping and pimping the show. Um, then of course our second shameless plug tonight, which we've kind of been teasing off all evening, is the Triumph 1200 Scrambler. So this is a super cool, radical unit here from Triumph, provided by Florian at Roadrunner. We're going to have it here on the set um, in our orbit for a little while. And um, so big kudos, shout out to uh, Florian for dropping it off, Triumph for making a great bike. And that's our shameless plug. Hey guys, Basil back for episode 13, and I'm just here again, you know, trying to come up with something cool, like it's a content contest, and uh, a lot of pressure. You know, um, Eric's like, hey, can dissect a frog in Microtech Knives, North Carolina, you know, and show them what's in a frog. Um, I, what is that about? Like, is this high school, like, biology class? No. So it's just, it's a lot. And so I just decided to distill it down into the quest for alien inclusion. Okay, let's just talk the acknowledgement factor. Um, this is a big deal for me, you guys. I really hope and I feel and I believe that these guys are the final frontier for unity, like on this planet. And if you're laughing right now, fine, but like, I just want to show you what I feel is the source of the stream as far as exotic propulsion and the Drake equation and the Nimitz encounters. These are the tip of the spear. There are so many people who are coming out now and just saying, man, this was my experience and it was real. There's some real shit now, folks, and it's high level military people, people who have the most to lose by telling their story. Um, did I bring, yeah, I brought the Drake equation, you know? Have a couple of pumpkin spice lattes and try to figure this out. But all this is really saying, folks, just bear with me. All this is really saying is that there's a certain amount of like Goldilocks zone in the Milky Way and it adds up faster than you might think. And the nearest possible kind of sweet spot is, um, is it Zeta Reticuli? And all this is, is like people like us, but they've been around for a billion years longer than we have. So yeah, they might not be fucking flying some rocketry around to travel and go on vacation. They might actually be able to bend space, which is kind of like where it's at. Just get rid of the whole, we're gonna fucking create some fire and get there. That's not like what's gonna happen. Um, it really comes down to like maybe some exotic materials that we can't mine here to like do some of this stuff, but otherwise it's, it's open season. Just get past that. That's not like the way the 
goes down. Look, I'm talking about this like I'm fucking selling a car that I know everything about. I don't, but I'm just saying like, this is the way you have to think if you're gonna get into the mindset of all of this stuff being possible. And um, that's kind of fun, right? And you don't have to be able to prove it. Um, it's just, I've jumped in enough rabbit holes to try to figure it out because it's a really cool problem when you think about it. Like, how do you navigate through space? I think it could be possible that all of this just, you know, basic external combustion flying rockets is kind of a dog and pony show for some of the real that we probably know about and that we've probably paid like billions in tax dollars to cultivate um, based on some of the folks that have shown up here and, and given us some help. So I've obviously put a lot in your lap tonight. It's a lot to unpack, but I do think you'll find a tremendous amount of satisfaction on a clear night. Just walk outside, make a habit of looking up, you know, and just think about it. Like, why shouldn't there be another group of hot messes like us? Maybe looking down at us. I think so. Good night. Good evening. I'm Nate, and this is Get Off My Lawn. I know it's hard for you people out there, wherever you are, and whenever you're watching this, or if you're even watching this at all. But in our little world here, it's winter time. Cold, blustery days where motorcycling is not at the top of your priority list, perhaps. So I wanted to take this time and go over some things for wintertime riding and hopefully some things that'll make sense to you. First of all, it's winter. We just said that, okay? It's cold, your bike's cold, your bike's just sitting there. So let's start there. So first of all, there's some things that you can do to make your bike a much happier bike in the winter months when you're not using it. First of all, let's talk about your battery. Don't be that guy or gal who buys a battery every year. You don't have to do that. If you're not gonna be riding for an extended period, take the damn battery out and bring it in. Batteries don't like being cold any more than you do. Second of all, if you are storing your bike for quite some time, go out and start it every now and then, okay? Don't just set it off to the side and pile shit all over it like you do your treadmill, okay? Because two things. One, you're not gonna run it and circulate everything and, and keep it up uh, and going, and you're probably gonna forget about it or the time, the warm day that comes uh, along that you didn't see coming, run it, you know, suck it up and run it around the block just to get everything circulated to keep the fuel moving. And talking about fuel, if you have a carbureted bike um, or even some fuel injected bikes, if it's sitting long enough, try to put some uh, non-ethanol fuel in there. Well, ethanol is just gonna absorb water and cause all kinds of green crap that you don't want. Then you're gonna have to come see me whining about your bike's not running right, okay? Let's move on to the hard ass people that are gonna continue to ride. There's definitely some advantages to riding in the winter. So you're the only biker out there probably, right? So there's not a people jamming up the roads that your favorite roads, uh, you know, so you might be able to get in some more riding or, or some more miles than you normally would. Um, now, if you are riding in the winter, let's remember a few things. Your tires and the tarmac are cold. Don't go out going Rossy right when you start riding. You know, give those tires a little bit of time to warm up. You know, uh, watch the road for any black ice or anything like that. Two wheels don't do very good with contact patch that big when they don't have any surface. Some things to avoid winter riding, um, you know, don't let your friends talk you out of it. Don't let them puss out and then you don't go ride and enjoy it, okay? Your friends are, you know, misery loves company as they say, right? Don't let them discourage you from riding. Get out there, put some heated gear on. There's all kinds of gear available now, battery powered, you know, powered by your bike. All that stuff has come way down in price. It's way available and it works really good. Now be careful, I'm told, once you go heated suit, you don't go back. <laughs> so just remember that. Some an Another thing to avoid, you know, in the summertime, you look like a freaking idiot, and I think we've covered this, wearing shorts and flip-flops. 
You do that in the winter, you might get committed. You, you may even enjoy riding so much that uh, old crusty Larry's gold wing starts looking good. You know what I'm saying? So don't careful who you make fun of because he's back there behind a windshield, heated seat, heated grips. You know what I mean? And you're on this little sport bike. So, you know, don't, don't be so judgmental. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyway, um, that's basically it for winter. Uh, I think I've covered pretty much everything. Uh, you're not going to ride anyway. <laughs> you wuss. Get off my lawn. Hey guys, Basil back here. Thanks again for watching. Um, and please feel free to comment on the uh, YouTube channel. Let's talk about the UFO thing. Let me know what rabbit holes you're jumping into. And thanks again. <laughs>